three, it says uh, about data exploration and processing. Exactly. If we look at data. and the topic modeling. Exactly. And sentiment analysis. So exactly. does that mean we prepare two specific uh, Jupyter notebooks for each? Uh, it would be better that way. Yeah. Okay. But, but as I, I think the most recommended uh, is just modular to make it either write first uh, classes, whatever. Because this the data exploration, what does it require? Already you have done it, probably. Like in if you are uh, at the cleaning, whatever module. Um, so you can import it there and do it. And here is just another. Yeah. So it's better to do it in two separate ones. OK. I think we have done the pre-processing where we extract uh, the data exactly. frame to the thing. So, uh, but we haven't, I think, specifically done uh, the data exploration. Okay. Using so in that case, just, okay. exactly. Just in that case, use just the visualization. Okay. So two specific uh, and uh, when we submit, we submit uh, the, the the paths like basically where the Jupyter notebooks are there. So it, it, if it's okay, like, can we submit uh, two links on the classroom? You could, but also it's like if it's in the same folder, you could just submit the okay. folder ones. But it's I think. Greater to create the folder for this one. It, it, it's almost always for me. I advise because we also look at you, how you structure your code. You know, so it's oh. better usually to create. It's not a necessity, but you know that's mm. the kind of better folder structure. If it's a notebook, call a notebook folder and just basically uh, put all your notebooks there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we are in time. Like, so hopefully people will join as we go on. So I will present. So what is today's tutorial? Again, let's look. If you just look at it today on the tutorial part. Sorry. So that's just uh, tutorials and day three. You know, it's data science component building. Um, so I'm just going to. Um, I will actually. So, so this is just the one we're gonna take. So day three is on uh, why and how each uh, component communicates with one another to form an end-to-end -end data science project workflow, um, logic, and you know dependencies um, <coughs> between between them. And in the afternoon, you will you will cover some modeling and sentiment analysis. And in, in now, we'll more talk about MLOps components, basically just a framework, OK? So at any time, if you want, you can just actually interrupt me. And let's make it interactive so that you know uh, you don't have to If I don't see your text, you can type it. But if I don't, hear, if I don't see, just you can also unmute and ask me, OK? So. I think some of you probably come from a computer science background, some of you from engineering background, it could be software engineering, some of you prob probably from another field like physics or mathematics or statistics or even any other field, right? So sometimes uh, we don't know some terminologies, but there's one thing that you should know when you are trying to be a machine learning engineer. What is a data scientist? What is a machine learning engineer? And what is the you know, data science, data engineer. So all of them, of course, is in the form they're trying to form, like in this whole system. Data science is, is not just only about, you know, machine learning. It's just all about the science of it. This is kind of developing algorithms and, you know, architectures. But in general, nowadays, AI and machine learning, it's kind of interchangeable names. Even if they are not, like something, you know, if you want the technical definition of machine learning is slightly different from AI because an artificial intelligence is, uh, it has a, it's actually much broader. AI is much broader than machine learning. Um, so it is, um, it's kind of, uh, we, we will just call everything, like in this, just for 10 academic training perspective, 
let's call everything data science, AI, everything machine learning, okay? Even if technically that's not true. Now, because we are preparing ourselves for to be machine learning engineers, and a machine learning engineer is, so there's no clear board definition, but what in, practic in practice it means is that it, it, unlike data scientists, the data scientists could be like a lot more like people are wanting these days, PhD holders, who's kind of knows the statistics, who's that, who's kind of doing science of it. Um, so I'm not sure who's accepting. Um, do I have to accept or uh, can someone accept? Because I, I, I have to switch. So Abu Bakr, can you, are you able to accept? Abu Bakr? Okay. Who's there from the team? I know that Arun is there, but... Um, I'm here. Lawal, oh, yeah. can you accept? Oh, yeah, I can't accept. Hmm. Okay, so let's just see. Um, so, um, so a machine learning engineer is trying at this moment is really what is mostly um, kind of sought after because just like anything, always science is trying to do you know what is not known and kind of explore and find something but an engineer in this case is trying to really make it work like whatever is available whatever is already developed they still have to develop sometimes you know they they, they have to still do some things um like they have to train a network but they're probably not expected to just be too much doing a lot of like this architecture finding or a new algorithm type but whatever is algorithm is there whatever is uh, you know data is there they have to do just like data science they overlap just like devops like it's kind of the developers and the operation uh, team it's kind of as if it's training it's also a machine learning engineer is also joins with the data science so that's always this overlap because they have to do the same thing uh, they they need sometimes to train but what of course is data scientists are not caring what machine learning engineers care is the system that means they, they need to make it work not just only for one experiment but they want to they have to do it for the kind of the system like the entire company or uh, you know like uh, the industry they have to deploy it they, or they have to take care about not only training but also how it's going to be deployed and that means they have to be pipeline centric so there are different types of centrism so data scientists generally they just work on their notebooks and and kind of work you know care about that but they probably don't care about how each system is going to be deployed and how they they kind of work together and um, but machine learning engineers have to think about like you know where is the data repeatability is the business kind of accountability and all that uh, stuff. So there is the system centric. And in this terminology, it's called just like DevOps because machine learning contains data on top. So development, software development, traditional, what does it contain? It contains almost entirely the assets are code. And then just uh, if, if it's not a code, maybe image or some folders, but they are kind of like static. So it's kind of static asset. But the dynamic asset in a DevOps in, 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 in DevOps is usually codes. And so what you need is everything that DevOps has been um, developed is for code management. So even the CICD, the continuous integration, continuous develop deployment, and, and all that, which in the continuous integration we talk about like versioning, in this case Git, or like has some kind of like this, um, automation tools like some configuration files like Travis or you know uh, Jenkins or uh, CI, um, Circle CI or many they kind of still about codes and deploying and then some kind of um, assets that are that are kind of like uh, that comes from that so for example it could be deployed on a docker so that means the, in this case just a, a docker container becomes some kind of 
uh, thing to manage. So they have to manage that one, the versioning and all that, but still they, they live around code and code products, code artifacts. While in machine learning, we not only have code, but we have data. And not only data, we have models. So, and so the same as the DevOps, which we have to manage the code, but on top of that, we have two other layers that are coming as important, the version, the versioning of the data and the versioning of the models, right? So that's why in this terminology, you will see MLOps instead of DevOps, because that Dave just, it's not only development of a code, but also it's more a machine learning uh, part. AutoML is the, the kind of like with MLOps, you wanna get to this, you know, sought after system called AutoML, which means that the manual intervention is gonna be so little it becomes almost code, like DevOps, that you just only develop a code, but the entire thing is kind of like the data change, whatever, you abstract, you take out basically the, the data layer because it does its auto-processing, it does its auto-model versioning, even searching for appropriate models, such that you take out you know, the, the complex nature of the ML and you turn it into kind of almost DevOps, that becomes auto-ML kind of because it's automated, most uh, feature finding, data cleaning, and all that is automated. So we'll talk about ML systems and pipelines. If you don't understand something, then as I said, but before starting there, let's think about system thinking, because that's where mostly, you know, like uh, fresh graduates or people who haven't experienced it, sometimes they may not have that clear understanding. Why, why, why should I do that? Like, because it, it's just enough. Like Jupyter Notebook, you get the, the data, you run something, you really think about it, and you, know, you, you do amazing model, you get it, you get the result, why not enough there? Why do you have to do system thinking? Or like, why do you want to think about in system? The reason is because you want a job, and you're gonna be, and the people who would employ you and who would pay you more, actually are people who have more tasks, more team, more people. And those teams, they really have to interact with, with interaction, you need to have a system, otherwise it will just fail. Just even for us now, you know, to manage this number is much harder than if I were just doing it myself, right? So, so that means there has to be there is an environment and then from the environment we have a boundary and then we have a system of interest. In this case, just every business has their own system of interest. So they sometimes have their own cloud. They probably have different components like the sales team, the blah, blah, blah. blah. And in each of them, you have to optimize, systematize, develop, like if you are a developer, you have to have like a dashboard, a GUI, and another system, like a backend, a frontend, you know, UI, UX, and all that thing has to be developed within a system of interest. And then, of course, each of in that system of interest, you have also subsystems, like a team, for example, uh, who is kind of a reporting team, like the sales, for example, or the product team, probably would just need its own system like because they need different needs right so so that's what a system thinking means there is a distinction made intentionally so let's not call it by only someone that there is intentional distinction between uh, the environment and what is the boundary and and within that the difference of systems so normally what is traditional thinking is just this exactly what we know we have a task we do another task you know and if it involves the other one, then we go back to, to that system. So it says continuous. If we want to make it parallel, it's still within that framework. Let's say we, we just then add more and more and more people and they do each thing. So the relationship, whatever, they might be relationship. After this, maybe it's another person doing it. It's okay. It's still possible, but it is not well designed. Just like a house made without thinking at first the different components, how they interact, uh, this is how it's done normally, just individuals or as small teams, whatever do. But if you really wanna go to the system, then you really have to understand the complexity, learn and intentionally kind of rearrange it such that the system is more efficient. So that's all about it is efficiency, because you could do the same thing, but if, if this way, just the traditional way it might take you you know, the, to do the same task, develop, let's say, a platform to, for your clients, it might take you one year, while with a proper software development system, 
um, it might take you just only two months and even less or something. You know, it's just because you are efficient and you do it and also maintenance wise, many, many levels, at many levels you reduce uh, the complexity so you grow. So by making it structured, you grow basically. So, you know, it's a very, this is from systems theory and it's as you, some of you might know, this is very the same as also, I will just come to it, uh, develop DevOps uh, development cycle, core development cycle, but even in any system, there is an initial idea, feasibility study, requirement analysis, system analysis, then specification, then system design, development, testing, implementation, maintenance, and review, right? So they are not just like that, but normally they have the certain cycle, but of course, you know, like this could be just cyclic in each other. From here, one can jump also another place, right? But so this is basically on each of them, each of these blocks, of course, internally, they have also even to do feasibility study, they are, it's a subsystem, right? So you need to have its own system on how to study feasibility. So, but the general other way to break work, like a given task, a given kind of holistic work, like, oh, let's just, you know, even a company, it could be, but also as, as simple as like uh, the project we are doing. So each of them then are kind of composed into some structured way such that we can manage. The first one in our unit, let's call it the element, is task. So a task in this case, we will define it just a piece of work, or you can call it a logical, so we have a continuous thing to do, but then we break it into a set, a, a piece of work that has, that can be done or should be done within a defined period of time and has a predefined outcome. Just for manageability, that outcome needs to be and time, it has to be time limited. Okay, let's agree that just when we say task, when I say task one, of course it has in its own multiple things, but task means just like it's a piece to do and the delivery to come, right, out of it. Then beyond the task is a process. So it's usually you might hear in companies and anywhere process thinking. You know, we should think about, it's called process improvement. Process, process comes because like, just like an industry like, uh, which is manufacturing a car, or it could be like processing a meat or anything, there needs to be a set of just kind of like tasks and each one is responsible in this task. It could be the same person responsible for multiple tasks, but multiple people. So it basically parallelizes tasks. So it's, it's kind of introduces task parallelism, you know? So that's a process. It's kind of, you really just take multiple tasks and you put them as one process, and then you kind of do different processes. So that's, the, and then there's workflow. When you go to a higher part and you wanna actually, you know, you wanna not only it's the hierarchy, right? You want to not only just manage processes within, you know, that falls under a certain category, but you want to have a workflow for a set of processes, you know, or a relationship. So you define one workflow, for example, for a particular, for a something which is made up of um, some general relationships of processes. And here, what you do by workflow, you introduce process parallelism. You know, multiple teams running is, so each team, for example, you can consider in a, in a traditional company or in a company, you know, each team basically you can call it a process and then uh, multiple teams kind of running separately, differently is a kind of um, workflow kind of concept you can take. And then there is pipeline. A pipeline is, again, it's another higher hierarchy. It's a set of workflows and introduces workflow parallelism. Again, the reason why pipelines is good is that because is imagine just like all companies, so there, there may be one startup, another startup, and if you are trying to manage all of them separately as a, as a let's say, an um, incubator, so you become kind of a pipeline, right? So it's basically just like one takes into account the other and tries to introduce parallelism to the other, such that efficiency grows, you know? The more you parallelize workflow, then it really kind of goes into like, multiple tasks you can do at one time, right? So, and efficiently and with some set of monitoring. So this is just a general, really nothing uh, thing. So, but why do we need a workflow? Usually we, you know, when we talk about our level, like here, we always say like, oh, design your workflow, think about your workflow. So why do we talk about too much workflows? 
pipeline is another, as I said, when you are especially more in a company, in a bigger sense, you really start thinking pipeline centric. Right now we are workflow centric. And the reason is, of course, it's of course easier to automate uh, some processes and easy to manage. It will be repeatable across different situations and it will really, really minimize the waste in terms of time, money, and it can be agile, easy to adapt for new change in the process and improves communication as well as also delivers high quality. So these are the, the kind of things that you would get from a workflow. Then let's talk about development. In this case, really, I'm talking about software development because this is just related. So it just comes from a system thinking, of course, like the system cycle, but it takes, it's deliberately suitable for software development. It has, in general, six uh, elements. You plan it, you design it, you implement, test, deploy, and maintain. So it, it goes along that line, but it's agile so that any change one from the other becomes much easier. To be agile, what you need is, uh, I will just go to that. Actually, to be agile, you need to introduce this um, continuous integration part where it's basically like multiple people can, can change or also some kind of other systems, other frameworks in your team. For example, it could be Scrum methodology or Kanban, where like, you know, that at, at each piece you kind of divide also your time such that at that time you produce something so you kind of always just like you you, you instead of a year you, you probably set your sprint cycle to be like let's say one week or two weeks and then within that you space you kind of deliver something such that you know if you need to change you only just only change a small amount right so it's kind of there are uh, controls so like that means you need to say it to actually manage development, then you also have to need some kind of control control um, part, management and control, which basically is what I said, uh, Scrum methodologies could be, it could be Kanban, it could be other methodologies that kind of plans and organizes the work, you know? So divides the time, blah, blah. So these control objectives in this case would be like, you set objectives to yourself. Uh, we are a company, we could say like, we are a company who is really always just customer or client oriented. Client first, that means we listen to clients and any feedback that comes to the client gets into the cycle of this development and disrupts. And, and that happens because the control, the management and control kind of plans and organizes and uses a certain system. Um, so, and then there is operations because of course every development is to be deployed to be useful, to be used in production. By production, we usually mean in real life, in a, in a situation where it actually serves some purpose, solves some problem, right? So that also, is, uh, basically operation teams are usually just who owns the infrastructure and process owners. So they basically are enabling everybody. So they basically um, owns that, and they, but they have to use the same development cycle to manage this infrastructure and to make sure that, uh, you know, like outcomes are ensured, you know, ensuring minimum system interruptions and frictionless operation um, cycle. But as I said, they have to use, again, the DevOps methodology such that they, they you know, some of the, th the things they do is just the enable self-service, for example, for teams so that no blocking and then produce some standardized tooling and processes across the business, uh, bringing extensible automation such that, as I said, again, um, they basically increase efficiency and in working and shipping like developers. But just like that, the operations in the, in the DevOps uh, framework, that's exactly what happens. They both contain, because one cannot be separated from the other, then so the, the thinking should just be like involved both. Feedback loops has to come, ha will connect these two, the developers and the operators. Uh, and therefore, with that one integrated, you shorten the development cycle, increase the deployment velocity, and then you will have dependable production releases. And as I said before, just for them to work and kind of like happen like that, the, the tools that they use to, that increases this DevOps operation is this one is continuous integration and the other one is continuous delivery. So that's why we usually call CICD uh, part. Okay, now, Let's to our business and you know machine learning operations and auto ML, right? So 
I recommend this one. So these are both from Google. Um, one is a white paper and the other one is the, the part that, that they have written some time. So my, Google has been leading on this. And in particular, in 2015, they have, they have taught and released one paper which, was, uh, which details the practicality of deploying large-scale machine learning projects. And they, auto, they kind of outlined a number of challenges and since then, of course, the field has grown so much. And now, probably the most, every company is requiring people to understand the tradition, just like any software company wanting people to have DevOps understanding. And also every company now, they want MLOps understanding, uh, which would lead to automation, auto ML, right? So this is the machine learning system. If you look at it, just in a very, very bigger system, like, so one of these are data engineers who are actually really versatile as well. They actually act like a machine learning sometimes, you know, data scientists, but their main role is engineering the data, you know, curating the data in some, with some requirement and keeping this infrastructure and whatever is necessary for the data to be manageable, accountable, and versionable and all that. And then, when the curated data is available, let's start from that machine learning agency. Of course, in a smaller company, all these are one, like it could be one person. In a slightly like medium company, of course, you probably would just data engineer, uh, machine learning engineer will be separate, but probably the app engineer becomes part of. And in a more uh, companies, then this becomes big teams in its own. Uh, and then there will be data scientists here there will be like software developers there and stuff like that, okay? So just like, as I say, DevOps, the cycle for MLOps is slightly different. The reason why it's different, because machine learning contains not only codes, you have to remember two other additional components, data and model. So that means it's not only just one development, it has to be machine learning development. But the machine learning development requires training things that are not there. It was just only coding in DevOps. Here, there, are, there needs also training or operationalization. And not only it needs only just to make it training possible, but also it needs continuous training because this thing is like, you know, it needs to, the model will drift. So, and then of course the model deployment, and then after the model deployed, then it needs also to understand the serving, like, you know, whether the customers are getting feedbacks and all that, which is the no, no monitoring. So this is data model and I would say code management. So that's what MLOps uh, or why it's different from, from DevOps. And as I said, most of the time, like when we think of it, we think of machine learning as writing machine learning codes. But that's not true, as you could see, there's so many components that machine learning code is actually is really a simple part in, a, in an industry level or in a, you know, in a, in a actual reality. Because before that, to ensure that we have something, we need to build all this data collection, data verification, feature engineering, testing and debugging, configurations for the system, automation, resource management, model analysis, whether it works, in any, even a smaller company, it requires some of this code. So it's not just only writing code and machine learning code, but it's really taking into account all these elements, okay? So this is an end-to-end -end workflow for MLOps. Um, and that is, of course, you start um, some, some elements of data and model management. Let's assume in this case, we gave you just like in Twitter data, we gave you, we gave it you in a certain way, it is already in Git like uh, in a data folder, you know, we only ask you a very small data engineering element because we just ask you to start just the ML development part, like, right? So that means like including, in this case, including the lead, reading the data appropriately and cleaning it and all that. And then of course today, you are like, you're doing this code and configure. The reason we want it is that we want scalable. We, we don't want you to, we want you to write a general code that will work also for another data. The same thing, but some another data, you shouldn't change the code. So we want you to plan and decide how you're going to train it, you know, that, that basically what we ask you to submit today. And then 
of course, we are not going to do continuous training, but in, in a case, if you are deploying, for example, your work into a real job like that, let's say it is monitoring uh, some kind of brand awareness uh, for a certain company from Twitter. So let's say that's the task you are given. In that case, you don't want just only one one day data, like or a certain uh, static data. So you probably have to continuously download data uh, and then continuously train, uh, improve the model and kind of like that. And then there should be a dashboard, which would be on model like here, like that you deploy. And then um, basically, of course, um, hopefully, uh, the, after the deployment, it's just a prediction. It will have like its own monitoring. So that means you sometimes can apply just some simple monitoring, which says like, okay, if the accuracy level is above this level, you know, uh, trigger something. Uh, if not, just continue to it. So that's like more, you know, predicting serving. That could be a trigger to ask model improvement, whatever. And then if you want to see how it's performing, whether you are, you know, your brand is going up or down, whatever. The, you need to also see the monitoring, okay? So, but to really have, an, you know, like in a certain organization to have that capability, you need a certain features, like, uh, or that's what ML ops capabilities. So one is, of course, you know, you have to think about how the data is coming, where it is coming during training and after training during deployment. So for example, Twitter data is, is what you have, at the moment, the data that comes to you is in a disk, like, you know, it's just in a folder. But if when you deploy it, what it, it should work is actually it should work for actually uh, data that's streaming. So it's still in the same format, JSON, but it is streaming. You don't control, you don't see it, you don't have, you know, you didn't filter it and all that. So it needs to really have like certain from that, how you extract whatever, it's, you, you need to just build a certain layer that uniformizes this thing between training, you know, testing, and, and deployment. So it's kind of, let's call it data set and feature repository. So it's called feature store, and normal. And then in between that, you experiment, you, you know, pre-process, train, evaluate, whatever. And finally, this just layer, let's call it experimentation layer. And after experimentation layer, you basically get some model, and that model is kind of quantified by its metadata, and if it, for example, produces some PKL file, Python uh, pickle file, or if it deploys some kind of, I don't know, some neural network thing, so let's call everything that is there is artifact. So then you need this metadata and artifact repository. And then not only that, whatever allows you to, whatever you use to produce those artifacts, then they have a code, they are a code, they also need their own artifact repository, and they have to be, they, they might change themselves, so in that case, Git, as well as Travis. But on top of that, the data needs also versioning. It also needs to probably, the code that's used to version the data or to whatever will come also there. So sort an artifact repository. And then, of course, on top of that, when you are you know, serving it, Twitter probably, for example, will not allow you to share Twitter data. Uh, that you download because you know you agreed on something. So let's call that one a security. So probably only you allow to show only some processed Twitter data, but not raw data. So you kind of need to to get security. And then where you are going to deploy your model? Basically, is it in a you know for yourself, like in a computer in your desktop or in a cloud or in a you know Heroku server? So that's let's call just whatever you use to manage infrastructure. So the development process. So let, let me just stop there and let me ask if there is any uh, question. Are you following? Okay, great. So if you have any question, as I say, just don't worry. Like this is just an informal, it's not a normal, you know, formal class. This is more all about to give you this understanding of why we are asking you to do all this um, such that you will feel, okay, you know, it's, I understand where they are coming from. Let's yeah, follow that, so, okay. Um, so, the machine learning, like this development process is, as I said, there will be data engineering somewhere. If it's a big company, really, it has to think about 
you know, there's probably a team that's doing data engineering. That means building infrastructure. Um, so let me just accept. Oh, it's accepted. Good. Um, so that that kind of things about you know how the data should be, where is the data, how it's stored, which infrastructure we are using, you know how many databases and which type of database, SQL, no SQL, or how, what is the aggregated, where is the raw data, or do we need to create data lakes or data, you know mesh or some other? Where sh should we be like pipeline centric, warehouse centric, blah 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 blah, a lot in its own. It's a big right especially the more data, the more, if your business is about data generation, data selling, Facebook, for example, is really just all about data. Google is all about data. Many companies these days are all about the data they collect, so they really have to think clearly about how, like, the external and internal, how people can access their own data, plus how the machine learning engineers internally can access the data, and when, when, it, when it's accessed, you know, monitoring the cycle. So there's always departments on that. But let's imagine that has been done. We start from somewhere because that's taken care of. So we get, all we have to do is just, we have features. So we have feature repository um, and data sets. Let's call it just, yeah, we can access it. Then you start from this experimentation prototype. Of course, in that experimentation, there's problem identification, you know, finding the right data because here the data could be just like, you know, like if you are Facebook, there is like, you know, uh, from a single user, you might get a lot of data. A user can be like a company and not only that, it could be that advertisement, their preferences, their friends, but you know, so much other types. But if you are just Twitter, even Twitter is like the type of Twitter, it's a, you know, then just the raw data is coming here. But here, like, what, which columns are you going to use actually for this one? So you, in, for that, you require you start actually identifying a problem. What are we solving? In this case, we are asking you to just topic model, right? It's, you could do so many things with Twitter, but we are asking you one thing. Just understand what people are talking and, and find the kind of, you know, topics. Summarize them in, some, in terms of number of copy, talk topics. So that's kind of okay. Then what do we need for topic? We probably need the text and stuff. So you select like the data and also it's like, okay, what is the type of topic that I'm interested? Like I can exclude, for example, anyone talking about football if I'm not interested in football. So uh, that's where data selection. And then, okay, the data is selected now, but the data is also still not clean and also probably doesn't, like for the topic, I might need to transform it. For example, it's a text and I don't need to process a text. Maybe I want to project it into into numbers, so that means I will do some kind of counting, in a, you know, words and kind of putting them in a dictionary, and I, I would just call word embedding. You know, it's like so I could do word vague or some other uh, embedding, such that I kind of uh, so for that I need to explore it, and then I will, as I said, you apply some transformations. Maybe you know, again, you are experimenting. Maybe in this case, word vague or maybe TFIDF or any something. Then you get like the, some kind of engineering. You need to store that. Like that's what is called. Actually, you really have to store um, these features. Once you fix this experimentation setup, you actually need to put it in a certain called feature store. So it sometimes could be the same, the same as this uh, feature repository. But sometimes it could be just this could be a raw data, and then you will have separate feature store um, from which you 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 will at any time use to to train. And then you, of course, not only that you. You use because the only way you know is that if you just model it and validate it, and if, if not, and then check again with your problem and then you know iterate. So this is data scientist's job, inventing and whatever in there. But once you do that, so the models, basically the good models that you get, blah blah, you kind of put them into a model a registry and whatever is like the artifacts, like for example, hyperparameters you find useful because you did hyperparameter optimization, blah blah you put them in some metadata uh, or artifact repository, as I said. Then, of course, all the codes and configs that are able to do that will be in version control. And then, basically, just, you know, you, you kind of, like, deploy it. Um, so it will just come to it. So the training operation part, so that's all just on the development process. Like, you know, we're not yet deploying anything. It's just more like controlling and seeing and like it's kind of finding the the process that involves in developing machine learning 
Here we are more inter interested to visualize or bring out the operations that are needed. Again, version control is needed. CICD triggers, that means when something is happens, um, like when you train, you need to have set up you know, CICD triggers that would be like, you know, git hooks or it could be some other thing. Uh, it could be Travis, that's what we are asking you. So it's like from operation perspective, that's what you see. That's what it means. So then in a continuous integration, you build, you ingest, integrate, and then you kind of continuously multiple teams. Not only, so this is integration across time, integration across people. So it's like, you know, it has multiple dimensions. And in the deployment, from a deployment side of operations, of course, you need to stage it, test it, and pro, you know, deploy it to production. Um, and then, of course, depending on like once you are kind of like accept, and you basically could have releases that would also be just uh, served. So I think you can follow up on that. So this is if you look at it from the same thing from operation perspective, the type of operations uh, that are required for machine learning and this is from a deployment perspective you look at it from deployment perspective of course there is we start from you know in the development side we have this model registry so we want to start from there so that's why it starts from there and then again you, you have a cd continuous deployment part it builds the model integrates it if it is like kind of a code or a configuration for example it will actually triggers it it integrates that one it builds, it tests, and deploys to production. And then, um, actually, in the production environment, you can also check its performance and kind of like that means it's called online experimentation for that. And um, that also triggers model candidate models. It will kind of auto auto learn if it's like even in the production, some models can learn. That's why it's just this is part. And then from the monitoring side, because now everything is whatever. So the then there is a model surveying engine, everything is whatever, but then the performance has to be logged. So that means metrics that you define, for example, the accuracy of your model and all that. And, and also like how many people are coming, you know, like all that, like the outside part that's just interfacing you, that is also in logs, who is requesting and what, and the geography, whatever, blah, blah. And then basically you will have if if people are asking something for example if it's a face detection or in this case even twitter like so let's talk about twitter we are serving our model which is kind of you give it uh, uh twitter data and it will tell you the topic but then the problem is that the tweak the topic model used require is trained on a certain data let's say that data that was trained was more on people who tweet more on uh, footwork now is like the tweets that are coming, for example, it was the same thing. It was Tottenham, let's say. And now Tottenham, in this case, was actually more about football at some point. But then at another point, let's say there was a terrorist attack in, in, a, in a city there. Now Tottenham is kind of a lot more coming from like a, a different angle. So then there would be kind of the data, we call it the data is drifting. That means that like, it's still you assume the data is coming from the same or whatever, whatever, but then like the actual model is trained, and then what is coming is kind of are different. So so there is data drift, concept drift, detection. So that's basically, and then so that you continuously evaluate and you basically just trigger, you know, you alert the development as well as the training uh, part. So for the development part, you kind of like, you know, do some kind of update the model part. And from the, on the training side, you basically just say like train new model with a new data. So from the development side, you will just get that more data. It will trigger just to collect recent data and then kind of does the training, does the deployment again, and then again back to this monitoring part. Okay. So that is overall, like just, uh, this is again the references that I use here, uh, I gave you here, so you can actually read more in detail. But that's so we are trying to, you know, I don't ask you to basically um, uh, understand all this, right? Because this is just more complex, and even the relevance sometimes you only understand it once you work on it. So the whole point is that whatever you understand, whatever you get, try to understand a little bit of it, such that you get a better idea than before. And then try to answer and kind of within this framework, 
do simple things, simple planning. So for your Twitter uh, project, like you want to design now, okay, what, which components do you need? You don't need all that component. That's a complicated for a company you know, like Google or whatever. In this case, it's you. Assume that you are the first developer for your own company, which is planning to do some Twitter analysis. So you're designing it for that. Or you're probably working on a company whose business is not probably Twitter, but you are a data scientist or a machine learning engineer, and you are asked to do like some kind of, okay, we want to monitor our, what people talk about us, you know? Uh, it's a brand, let's call it, you know, Coca-Cola. And just, you know, how many people are actually good and bad? Like, what is their topic when they, when they talk about Coca-Cola? So you're probably just getting the tweets from like the data and you're trying to set up, you know, continuously that you will just uh, tell you, you will deploy something and will kind of monitor that. To do that, you have to set up that kind of design. So design something, you know, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be complex. It just have to be simple. It's like, okay, data is here and then I need to set up that. I need to alert this and then I need to set up. And it just make it such that you can write all of those codes yourself slightly, okay? So that's the idea. Um, so I finished. So if you have any question, you can ask me. If not, then yeah, we stop here and we will continue discussing over Slack. Uh, sorry, over Rocket Chat, sorry. Yeah, I know that it is, as I said, it is really, but you are gonna be working in these areas and you don't have to learn it in one day, you can only do something. So don't think the, the, the end, this is the end that we are showing you, like or like what you will be, but right now you are just trying to get there. So, you know, take your time, like, but just put the hard work that is needed, that's it. So with that, let's stop here and we'll continue over Rocket Chat. Cheers, guys.